You're listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta a España in association with Rafa. Celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today we're in Madrid. Hello, my name is Lionel Burney. I'm not in Madrid for the final stage of the Vuelta a España, but Daniel Freib and Fran Reyes are, and we'll hear from them a little bit later in this final episode of the Cycling Podcast from the Vuelta. Chris Froome has won the race, completing the double, adding the Vuelta to the Tour de France that he won in July and becoming the first rider to complete the double since the Vuelta moved to its late season spot 22 years ago. He joins Jacques Anquetil and Bernardino as only the third rider to win the two stage races in the same season. And he's also taken the green jersey in a bit of a turn up for the books on the final day in Madrid. Froome has won with a margin of 2 minutes and 15 seconds ahead of Vincenzo Nibali. Ilno Zakarin is in third at 2.51. Wilco Kelderman actually climbed above Alberto Contador. So Kelderman, the Dutchman, finishes fourth, with Contador slipping to fifth. And that was because Contador came in just off the back of the peloton and lost a few seconds. Uh, he won't mind about that, though. This was the final stage of his career. He's won all three Grand Tours in his career and he was afforded the honour of riding into Madrid and uh, starting the finishing circuit ahead of the peloton. He waved to the crowds, uh, big smiles, signing off in style on the Angli Rue yesterday of course. Whether it crossed his mind to press on and try and gain the time to haul himself onto the podium, well that's not really the done thing on the final day is it? Uh, having said that, Chris Froome was in full race mode because when it came to the intermediate sprint, Froome and Sky tried to disrupt the rhythm of quick step and tried to pinch points from Matteo Trentin, who had his eyes on winning the green jersey. Trentin managed to win that intermediate sprint and he won the bunch sprint to claim his fourth stage win of the Vuelta. But it wasn't enough to give him the green jersey. Chris Froome sprinted to 11th place on the stage and so adds the green jersey and the white combined jersey to the overall red jersey. Quite a collection of uh, jerseys for Froome there. The only other jersey was the King of the Mountains jersey, and that went to Davide Villela of Cannondale Drapak. So the Vuelta has concluded. It's been a successful one for Quickstep, who've won six stages in total. Yves Lampert, of course, won way back in France at the start of the race when he was trying to lead out Trentin. The gap opened and he went for it. Trentin has been the star sprinter in what has to be said hasn't been a stellar lineup uh, when it's come to the bunch sprints. Not that there have been you know, too many opportunities to tempt the sprinters to come to the Vuelta this year. And of course, Julian Alaphilippe also won a stage. So very successful for Quickstep as well as their rival Belgian team, Lotto Sudal, who won four stages, two of those thanks to Thomas Marcinski, one for Sander Armé and one for Thomas de Ghent. Earlier on in the evening, there was the Women's World Tour race, uh, the Madrid Challenge, and that was won by Jolien de Hoor, the Belgian rider who rides for Wiggle High Five, ahead of Corinne Rivera, one of the uh, breakthrough riders of the 2017 season. The American team Sunward rider was second. Uh, you can hear more about the uh, Madrid Challenge in the next episode of the Cycling Podcast Feminine, which will be uh, coming out uh, not too far in the future. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. But as this is our final episode of the Vuelta a España we thought we'd look back at the uh, race as a whole and myself Daniel Freib, Fran Reyes and Richard Moore well we answered some of the questions and uh, discussed some of the talking points from the last three weeks. What was the best or your favourite stage of the race? The stage that I appreciated was Calor Alto, the stage 11 up to the observatory. It was horrible weather and we saw the first cracks in Chris Froome, I thought. He, he looked like he was struggling. He always looks like he's struggling. I should caveat that. But I thought that he was in a bit of trouble. But I, I also thought, conversely or paradoxically, that it was also the stage where I think Froome showed just how much he wanted to win the Vuelta. He had to really fight, I think, to like, a point to stay in the, in the group. Nibali was it was the first day we really saw Nibali on the offensive, albeit he won in Andorra, but it was the first day I thought Nibali was going to be the big challenger. And Fruma, 
I think had to really, really fight. He was he only had Nimiki on the heavy left with him at the end. And he doesn't like that weather. It was awful, awful weather. It was a real epic stage. It was a sort of mini Angleroo, if you like. It was a brutal day. And I thought it was, uh, there, there were there were signs of hope and optimism for the race because I thought Froome looked a bit in, in trouble. But I also, I also think I realised that day just how much he wanted it and how much it meant to him to, to win the Vuelta. So it was, a, I think, a very significant day. And I think when he looks back on the Vuelta, I think it's one that, day that he will single out as a day on which he sort of laid the foundations for winning the race. My favorite stage was the one of the Sierra de Espadán with the final line in uh, Sagunto. That was a great tactical display by Alberto Contador that caught everyone by surprise. He took advantage of knowing perfectly the terrain to launch an offensive that really laid some casualties. Not only TJ Van Garder and Carlos Betancourt that, who crashed off the race, but also the moral of uh, many of the favorites who saw themselves kind of inferior to Contador and Froome. In the case of Froome, he reasserted himself as a stronger man of this Vuelta a España. And overall, the show was amazing because in addition to the GC fight, we had the first great breakaway of this Vuelta a España with Tomá Marchiski getting the victory of a lifetime for himself. My favourite stage was stage 17 from Villa Diego to Los Machucos. That was the day that Stefan Denefield won for Aqua Blue and we had this chase between uh, Alberto Contador who was uh, trying to close him down and Denefield who was riding extremely strongly and had probably been underestimated in terms of uh, ama the amount of headway he'd been given and allowed to have going into the bottom of the climb. The climb itself was really interesting. I was most looking forward to the Angleroo, but uh, Los Machucos, which was a new one for the Vuelta, um, caught me by surprise, caught everybody by surprise. It was really rough, difficult. The concrete sections were nasty. The fact the weather wasn't great just made it a, a day when there was a sense that things could change very, very quickly. And it was, of course, the day that Chris Froome probably showed the greatest vulnerability of uh, the whole summer, really. Uh, he lost uh, a little bit of his advantage to Nibali that day, and it looked like the race might be back on with the Angleroo still to come. I don't say that because I wanted Chris Froome to lose or anything like that, but I'm a big fan of drama, suspense, and, and not quite knowing um, who is going to win. And I, I always think it's... You know, it's good that you see uh, the race winner come through moments of adversity like that. Um, he dug very deep and had some great support from his team that day. My favourite stage was stage 18 to Santo Toribio de Yebana. It was an unusual stage. The thing I liked about this stage was the route. Um, it was uh, an unusual profile with two third category climbs and then a second category climb, then a third category climb to the finish. It was considered to be or classified as a medium mountain stage but not the kind of medium mountain stage we're used to seeing in Grand Tours. You, it was one of those days where um, you could look at the profile and really know, have no idea how it was going to play out. Was it going to be a GC day? Was it not? Of course it ended up being a GC day because at this Vuelta Alberto Contador has made every day pretty much a GC day and it's a lot of the time that has been solely down to him. Contador attacked on this day. Chris Froome really reasserted himself. He had a very had a very good finale. Nibali lost time. And, and so it really told the story of the race. And it also told the story of the race in the sense that Sander Arme consolidated what was already a brilliant Vuelta a España for Lotto Sudal by winning the stage. To my surprise, beating Alexei Lutsenko. What was the biggest surprise of the race? For me was Wilco Kelderman. A few people talked about him, mainly Dutch journalists in the run-up to the race. We knew he was going to lead here. We knew that he wanted to do well on general classification. But at the pre-race sort of press event in Nîmes, um, he wasn't one of the well, seven or eight or so riders who were wheeled out. You know, the, both the Yates brothers were, were there. They figured more highly in most people's list of of contenders. Kelderman has surprised me by his with his consistency and also how stylishly he's ridden. He's looked fantastic, particularly in the last week. Also because he has continued this fantastic vein of form for Sunweb. What an, an unbelievable season they've had. A team who at the start of the season I looked at their roster, looked at the number of young riders, thought it was it was unbalanced. There were too many young riders, too many guys who might 
turnouts being consistent and they've all really come through for them. I suppose with the exception of Warren Barguil at the Vuelta because he of course had to pull out and that also made Kelderman's challenge and Kelderman's ride all the more impressive because he lost Barguil and he lost Sam, Sam Uman who would have been his key mountain domestique. The biggest surprise I'd have to say is Michael Woods of Cannondale Drapak. We knew he was a talent. We knew because of his slightly unusual story in coming to cycling late and certainly coming to the World Tour very late, having been a runner who had to give up running uh, largely because of injury, we knew he was a talent. But to come into his second Grand Tour, not just his second Grand Tour of the season, but his second Grand Tour and finish seventh um, consistently up there when the roads were at their steepest, um, it makes you wonder what sort of rider he could have been had he turned professional at sort of 21 22 instead of at uh, the opposite end of his 20s and um, you know that's not to say that opportunities have been lost because um, in the next couple of years we could well see um, Michael Woods challenging for the podium who knows perhaps even winning a grand tour as for the surprise of the Vuelta I would say that this hasn't been a Vuelta of big surprises I mean there, of course there have been some unexpected riders performing well but we haven't seen Tom Dumoulin or Chris Horner or Juan Jacobo scenario on which an unknown rider broke all the forecasted. I was surprised by Michael Woods because he performed so consistently over the three weeks of the race and I considered him a one day or one week rider at most. And uh, I was also surprised by how consistently the young Spanish rider performed. Of course, I was confident that Enric Mas, Marc Soler, and so on were going to show good face and to leave a good taste in the mouth of the Spanish fans. Yet the way they made it to the, through the three weeks of racing, being present and even competitive when it came to fighting for victories, was kind of a surprise for me. It's difficult to compare, say, the performances of Michael Woods, only his second Grand Tour, finished seventh overall. Uh, you know, I spoke to him quite a lot at his first Grand Tour earlier this year at the Giro d'Italia. So for somebody to ride the second Grand Tour um, in the same year and ride so well and be with the favourites pretty much every day, you know, he, he, was, he was the equal of these guys in the mountains. It was the time trial that really let him down badly. And... You know, tremendously exciting talent. He's come to the sport pretty late. He's obviously got a huge engine. Really enjoyed his performance. And it's difficult to compare the surprise of Michael Woods in seventh with, say, Gianni Moscon, riding his first Grand Tour and riding so strongly. We don't know what Gianni Moscon is capable of. Nobody knows. Um, and we, he clearly wasn't impressive every day, but there were days when he was, including on the Anglerou, in fact. And it, it, it's very difficult to compare those two riders' performances because they were very, very different. But two big surprises, I think, Michael Woods and Jeremy Moscon. And what was the biggest disappointment of the Vuelta? As for the biggest disappointment, of course, when there is such a vast list of favourites and of potential contenders, there is going to be a vast list of potential disappointments as well. It's, it's inherent. I was expecting more from Romain Bardet, Fabio Aru and uh, many other GC riders. But above all, the biggest disappointment for me has been Ulrich Scott. It's a team that we are used to see performing at their best in every goal they set for, them, for themselves. And in this race, they came with an amazing lineup, with the, probably the best lineup that they could put up together with the roster they have, with both Jade Twins, and Seban Chavez, yet the three of them kind of underperformed and fired it out of contention as the race progressed. And in the end, the best rider was Jack Hike, youngster that showed a lot in the Tour of Pologne and confirmed it here at the Volta. The biggest disappointment for me was well, twofold. One, I could already have announced at the start of the world, so that was the lack of sprinters here and the lack of guys who I think could probably have picked up quite comfortably at a stage win or two if they had been here, sort of sprinter puncher type riders. I think the route was, was good for a lot of guys who stayed away. Um, having said that, John Degenkolb was here and had a bit of a disaster. So no foregone conclusions. I think Roman Bardet was a big disappointment, not because he has let his team down or anything like that, just because I thought he was coming in with the right attitude. 
Um, he was treating it as, a, it as an adventure. I thought that would serve him pretty well. I also thought, he, you know, physically he's very robust. He showed that at the Tour de France. He's not a guy that has big peaks and troughs. And, um, yeah, I thought he would be right up there on GC, and particularly after Andorra. I think he, he rode a good race in, in Andorra and when a lot of the GC contenders were already starting to struggle. And, and I thought that set him up well for to at least finish in the top six or seven, but it wasn't to be. The biggest disappointment has to be Movistar, the Spanish team, the Real Madrid of Spanish cycling, if you like. We're so used to seeing them do something in the race, even when they uh, perhaps aren't racing for the podium. Um, they've had Naira Quintana and Alejandro Valverde almost ever present in the overall battles in the Grand Tours in recent years. Of course, both of those riders were missing here, Quintana because he'd already done the Giro and the Tour, and Valverde because of injury, having crashed out at the Tour. They came in with Carlos Betancourt, who unfortunately crashed out, so that can't really hold that against them. Mark Soler is a young rider, and we saw flashes from him, particularly um, heading towards the Anglieru before he crashed. But o overall and as a whole, they were pretty disappointing. Really, they kind of typified or, or signified um, the decline in Spanish cycling over the last few years. Um, Contador aside, it's been a poor race for the host nation, um, salvaged by Contador's stage win on the Anglieru. Uh, Carlos de la Cruz was looking um, like he might finish just outside the top 10, but unfortunately he crashed on the Anglieru stage as well. So overall, I would say kind of D- minus for Movistar and Spain. It's hard to say that's a disappointment, but Roman Bardet didn't back up his Tour de France right. And I think it was a late decision of his to ride the Vuelta, so he hasn't approached the season with the Vuelta in his sights in the way that Chris Froome has. So it, it would be harsh to label him as a disappointment, but I think he would have wanted a stage win. In terms of the race itself, I felt a lot a lot of stages were quite samey. Um, I also felt stages, when I think about recent Vueltas, I think of short, punchy stages. A lot, a lot of stages were quite long this year, and I think we could have done with some more shorter stages i think that would have maybe led to more aggressive and more unpredictable racing and, and would have given other riders and teams the opportunity to really attack team sky in a way that they perhaps weren't with the exception of alberto condador of course a listener asked us who would have won if nibali was riding for sky and Froome was riding for bahre merida did Froome win the Vuelta simply because his team was the strongest? It's a really good question, and it's impossible to say, of course. He used his team incredibly cleverly, I thought. He he really only made efforts when he took the race on, took the race by the scruff of the neck, when he'd run out of teammates. And he had to do that on occasions. And when he had to do it, he could do it. And, of course, not many riders can do that. So it's a bit of a tricky one because Team Sky wouldn't have such wouldn't ride in the way that they do with such commitment if they didn't have the confidence, the total confidence that they have in Chris Froome. And they have the confidence because they know that he's capable of winning. So it's very, very hard to say how Froome would have got on in the Barry Morita team and, and Nibali in the, in the Sky team. I suspect the result would be the same, but that it would be a little bit harder for Chris Froome. I think that Froome clearly had a great support from his team and that uh, he used it perfectly to his purposes of winning the Vuelta. The Team Sky came here way more focused than in previous editions of the race. All riders of the lineup performed kind of at their best level, but for maybe Diego Rosa and Ina Sanar, but you know, that's a perception from outside the race, so probably can be untrue. But I think Froome is a deserving winner of this Vuelta because after all while he has shown complete dominance, complete control of the every situation that has been put before him by his rivals. This competitivity makes him a worthy winner of the Vuelta España and I think the point of maybe Nibali with this team could have I'm, I, I'm higher I don't think so. I only say I don't think so. I think that in every what contest there was in the first week of the race, he proved to be one or two points below Chris Froome's level. And that would have been showed even more dramatically if it would have been necessary for Froome to win this race.
It's an interesting question. I don't really have an answer. I don't think Nibali was good enough to win the race, regardless of um, who his teammates were. Certainly not on that course. He, he was undone a bit in the time trial. The thing about having a team as strong as Team Sky are is that it gives an awful lot of protection through the whole of the race. Really, almost is an armchair ride, and Chris Froome just has to be good in the moments where he has to be good. And that may sound obvious, but he did that very well, and he was extremely good at reading when those moments were. And uh, as the other guys have said, it, it's not just the strength of the team, but it's knowing how to use that strength as, as intelligently as possible. I think Chris Room could have won the Vuelta with, without such a strong team, but he would have had to win it in a different way. We're seeing this phenomenon in Grand Tours now whereby podium places, top five finishes, even top ten finishes are career-changing moments, career-changing results for most riders, and therefore their teams are very willing to defend fourth place, third place, sixth place even. So what often happens is the leader is getting a lot of help from other teams inadvertently because of that. And I think if Froome had not found himself in the red jersey until maybe stage 18, 19, he could have capitalised on the work of other teams and perhaps not needed um, the, the sky train as we've seen it at the front every day. The other thing I think to say is, you know, people see an inherent injustice in the strongest rider having the strongest team. Well, this pretty much always happens and has always happened in the history of cycling because once a rider becomes very successful, they will automatically be courted by the richest team, the best team, or, you know, the sponsor will start to put in more and more money. So it kind of, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and that's what's happened with Sky. Um, it's, it's normal that the best rider in the world is also surrounded by the best team of domestiques. Of the other riders, who is the most likely to win a Grand Tour in future? I think in this Vuelta Espana, Wilco Kelderman has stated his case or underlined his credentials as a possible future Grand Tour winner. He's got the full repertoire of talents that you need to succeed in Grand Tours. Um, a good time trialist, very good climber, good temperament as well. So um, he's... Again, I said it earlier, but he has surprised me um, because I thought he was a rider who w had, was really a bit lost in the wilderness or had been for the last couple of years for a series of reasons. Ilno Zakarin looks to me like the rider who maybe five or six years ago would certainly have won a Grand Tour at some point in his career because you always used to get one of the Grand Tours in every season, usually the Vuelta that was, that was kind of neglected by the big stars, the Galacticos, the, uh, and, and someone like a Denis Menchov could pick up of Vuelta or uh, Juan Jose Cobo, um, that's not really happening anymore. The the top three or four names in professional cycling, uh, well, one of them is always present at one of those three Grand Tours, so that makes it very difficult for the next tier of riders. And I think Ilno Zakarin is probably in that next tier. I don't think he's quite at the top level yet, and he may never reach that level. But he's certainly someone who who will finish on podiums, I think, at, at Grand Tours for the next few years. It's hard. I mean, Miguel Angel Lopez was. Was good? Is he a p potential Grand Tour winner? I don't know. Wilco Kelderman, obviously a strong time trials as well as a good climber, but will he win a Grand Tour? It, it really depends on who else rides. You know, I mean, Kelderman will, will doubtless ride in support of de Moulin, Tom de Moulin at the Tour de France, you would think, next year. Does that mean he'll have an opportunity to lead his team at the Giro or the Vuelta? Possibly. And... Could he win one of those races? I think it depends who else rides. I, I really don't know. I mean, Gianni Moscon could become a, a Grand Tour winner in the future. We just don't know. Uh, the, we saw, as we always see at the Vuelta, we saw some breakthrough performances because riders go to the Vuelta in such varying states of motivation and fitness and form that you always see some surprises and you always see some breakout performances. And, and there were some names that emerged at the Vuelta that I'd never really heard of or didn't know much about. I mean, of the of of the guys that finish in the top ten, who could be a Grand Tour winner? Probably, Wilco Kelderman would be the most likely. You would think. I really like the look of Ilnur Zakarin. This is his second impressive performance this season. He was fifth in the Giro and finished third here, having basically pinched a podium place with a smart ride on Liangliru. I thought it was clever of him to um, just test Wilco Kelderman. Um, and, and perhaps put him into the red a little bit and, and then capitalise when uh, the pace went up a little bit later on. Um, interesting hearing from Fran's interview um, or, or hearing what Fran had, had got from Katusha about how they want him to 
uh, improve his race craft really he looks like he has all the tools to win a grand tour but of course it will all come down to who the opposition is um, if he were to find himself in a Giro or a Vuelta where there's not the same level or well, basically if Chris Froome's not there I think you could look at Zacharin as being a potential winner we can identify like 10 riders with potential to win a Grand Tour in the field that this Vuelta has had. Um, they, uh, Esteban Chavez, for example, seems poised too, but uh, he hasn't showed why in this race. And same can be said about he, the Yates swings and so on. Of those who have performed, I would like to see Miguel Angel Lopez developing a bit more of racecraft before giving him the status of future. GT winner because after all he has proven to be able to mark a difference to have that quality of climber that can make him gain a lot of time on the contenders of a Grand Tour. In Lord Sakharin, of course he has great potential and uh, but I don't see how Katusha who failed to win a Grand Tour with Purito Rodriguez despite being close to several times can make Ilnor win one. Where does Chris Froome's double of winning the Tour de France and the Vuelta a España rank in the all-time list of achievements? In terms of his achievements, I think it's his greatest achievement, winning the Vuelta and the Tour in one year. I think he said the Vuelta is the toughest Grand Tour he's ever won, and I think that's probably true as well i think it was a very hard race to win in terms of the, the sort of pantheon you know it's it, it's up there isn't it with the other greats and i don't know if that was a motivation for him i always felt that with Froome, the vuelta was unfinished business you know it's a race he's gone so close to winning in the past and never quite done it and he couldn't be satisfied until he'd won it and i think what's interesting now is what will he do next you know if he wants to be considered among the all-time greats then he probably would want to add a Giro d'Italia to it. So maybe we'll see him tackle the Giro, if not next year, then the following year. One word on Chris Froome winning the Vuelta and him and his team targeting it in the way that they did. I, I, a lot of, There's been a lot of criticism of the way that Team Sky sort of bludgeoned the race and, and controlled the race to some extent, although perhaps not to the extent that some people have claimed. But it's surely a very a sort of real vote of confidence for the Vuelta and for the sport that a team like that and a rider like that is is not just retiring after the after the tour which we've seen over the last decade or so riders have, have won the tour and then not not really raced after that so I think it's very good for the sport that Froome took on the Vuelta in the way that he did we want the top riders to ride the the, the biggest races and and the Vuelta has some years struggled to attract the, the stars and, and it's uh you know, its status has been, I think, a little bit in danger of, you know, slipping well behind the Giro and the Tour in terms of prestige. So I think what uh, what Froome has done this year is great for, for the Vuelta, for the health of the sport, uh, and hopefully will plant seed in other riders' heads that, that, you know, the Tour of Vuelta double is possible. It's the first time it's been done, of course, the Tour and then the Vuelta. Well, to, to be honest, I'm not very fond of... Uh comparing the peers of the 60s to the apples of the notice I, I am not a fan of history rankings but uh, if we compare them to their contemporaries of course Chris Froome's feet is awesome nobody has managed to do this in 20 years time only Marco Pantani did a double in 1998 so I think it's quite remarkable and definitely puts him on the he on the first position on the ranking of best three week Grand Tour riders of the century. I think Chris Froome's double here winning the Tour and then the Vuelta is the greatest or the best Grand Tour exhibition of Grand Tour riding in a season since EPO chain cycling in about 1992, 93. Hino and Merckx did had comparable feats. Merckx is 1973 when he won the Vuelta, the Giro, but then he also won the World Championships and, and various other things. You know, it might pale in, in comparison to those, but I think in the in the, what we call, might call the modern era, I think Froome's um, double definitely stands up or as as the the greatest exhibition, as I say, of stage race riding. Well, Chris Froome will always be the first rider to win the Vuelta and Tour de France 
uh, this way round, if you like. So the Tour de France in July and the Vuelta in the late summer slot. That's never been done since the race switched uh, around about 20 years ago. It's very difficult to compare to the previous eras. The Vuelta particularly was a, was a very different race back in the early 80s and certainly before that there wasn't the same um, you know, number of riders in the race wasn't the same depth of field, and really, as a grand tour, this phrase "grand tour" is a quite a recent and uh, sort of anglicised invention. Um, not terribly sure that back in the eighties, the Vuelta or indeed any of the races were considered grand tours, and certainly the Vuelta was the the weaker of the three in terms of not just the uh, the field, but also the course. the The spring slot in the calendar meant they often didn't go. Uh, particularly high there weren't the same um, difficulty of climbs as there are these days I think that what is most impressive about Chris Froome's achievement is that when you look at the statistics between July the 1st which was the first day of the Tour de France and September the 10th today the last day of the Vuelta there have been 72 days uh, he's raced a Grand Tour on 42 of those days and he's had well he's had 14 days in the yellow jersey 18 days in the red jersey that is really quite an impressive level of consistency effectively six weeks in ten that he's been racing at a grand tour and uh, it's not just the physical strength i think it's the mental strength that's required to do that to be uh, switched on focused not succumb when you know moments of weakness come along and to be able to just keep on going and keep his eyes on the prize if you like <laughs> Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Well, that really is it for our coverage of the Vuelta and our Grand Tour coverage this season. Daniel, Richard and I would like to thank everyone at Rafa and Science in Sport, our two main sponsors. Their backing is uh, what enables us to travel to the Grand Tours and report on the races. We also have to thank everyone who signed up as a friend of the podcast because your support really is absolutely vital to us. Without you, we wouldn't be able to go and cover the races. So thank you very much. We also couldn't have done it without our production team. They work incredibly quickly to get the episodes up online as soon as possible after the stages. And in no particular order, they are John Mooney, Tom Wally, Alex Aidy, Paul Scoynes, Matt Fee, Will Jones and Adam Bowie. A big thanks also to Jonathan Rowe who does an awful lot of unseen work behind the scenes for us and to Nick Christian who puts together our newsletter on a weekly basis. Simon the photographer, that's Simon Gill. You may have seen his uh, images on Twitter or Instagram if you follow us on Twitter or Instagram. He's also working on a secret project for us. A little bit more will be revealed about that in the coming weeks, I'm sure. He's been a fantastic travelling companion for me over the last week. And speaking of which, how could I not mention Fran Reyes? He's been a breath of fresh air on the podcast but he's brought his sunny disposition and his good humor and his singing and his knowledge of spanish cycling and spain itself and he's been a pleasure to work with over the last three weeks also have to mention his traveling companion victor martin who very kindly gave richard and i a lift during the early days of the vuelta uh, he drove us down from Nîmes all the way down to uh, somewhere on the eastern coast of spain we're very grateful for the lift he gave us too well that really is it we will be back in two weeks time because we're having a week off and then in the latter part of the year we will revert to our weekly episodes there'll be episodes of the cycling podcast feminine of course they are released on a monthly basis we've got a couple of friends of the podcast specials to do before the end of the year uh, thanks to everyone by the way who sends us uh, messages either on twitter or facebook or by sending us an email you can find our email address on our website by the way it's very much appreciated we do try to reply to uh, everybody who writes to us if we possibly can and if you've got some suggestions or something on your wish list something you'd like to hear us do particularly over the winter months do get in touch and let us know thank you very much and we'll see you again next time